Okay, in this video, I want to tell you guys a few questions of sign that you probably didn't know. So, here we go. For the first one, let's talk about the hyperbolic version of the sign. And the notation for that is, you just have sign and with an h next to it. And let's say the input here is t. And again, this is called the hyperbolic sine function. And why is this called the hyperbolic sine? Well, let me explain. To do so, we will have to look at the original sine function. And of course, we will have to look at the unit circle. So let me put down the circle here. And we know the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And the deal is that if we have a point on the unit circle that says right here, the x coordinate is the cosine value and the y coordinate is the sine value. So here is the deal. We have the cosine and also the original sine, right? And now here's the interesting part. If we have sine and let's say the input is t, we can interpret the t in this picture two ways. The first way is you can look at the angle from the past the x-axis to here for this ray. If you just connect the origin to the point, this angle is t. That's okay. Measuring radians, please. Another way to look at this is that you can see this little area is precisely half of t. So let me just tell you guys this right here, the area of this sector is just t over 2. So this is another way to interpret that. And the reason we want to talk about this is because, well, for the hyperbolic sine function, you just look at the hyperbola instead of a circle. And to do that, of course, you look at the hyperbola, namely, you just change the plus to a minus. So that you get x squared minus y squared equals 1. This way, you get this. And in fact, for the hyperbolic functions, you just look at the right hand side. So just look at this right here. And again, you pick a point on the hyperbola. The first coordinate is what we call the hyperbolic cosine. But let's not look at that. Let's look at the y coordinate, which is the hyperbolic sine. Well, if you have the input being t right here, this time, it doesn't make sense to talk about angle anymore. We will have to talk about the area from the origin, connect the dots to here. And this little piece is also t over 2. Very, very cool. So if you look at it like this, you see they are very, very close to each other, right? Similar ideas. So that's great. Well, we can actually do it better because we do have a really nice parametric definition for sine of t, sinh of t. This is called sinh, the hyperbolic sine function. This right here, we can write this as e to the t minus e to the negative t all over 2. So this right here is the one that you probably want to use when you want to talk about differentiating, proofing identities, etc, etc. This right here will back you up. All right, so this is the first version, namely the hyperbolic sine function. Huh, this is the cousin of sine. Now, let's talk about the next one. Let's say I want to just kind of switch things a little bit. I don't want to look at the h. I want to talk about this right here. S-I-N, which is the sign by with a C, so it becomes sync. This is sync, right? That's how you can say it, or you can just say hyperbolic sign. Um, sync, like that. And let's say the input here is X, because we like to use X. This right here, I didn't use X because we'll have to use the X right here for the picture. Anyway, what does this mean? I will have to tell you guys the definition for this. This is actually very, very cool. This right here, you look at two pieces. This is a piecewise definition for the function. The first idea is that you look at this as the regular sign, and the input is x, and you divide it by x if x is not equal to 0. However, if x is equal to 0, this right here is not defined because you have the 0 in the denominator. That's no good. But if you take the limit as x approaching to 0, you will see that this right here is approaching 1. And we'll just take 1 to be the limit for the Take 1, which is the limit, to be the value right here, if x is exactly equal to 1. So that way, you can make it a continuous function. And you will see the picture will look like this. I will try to draw. So it looks like this, like this, and like that. And originally, if you just draw this, you will have an open circle. But with this one, 0, 1, you get to fill in the circle. And the idea is that the picture will just like look like this. So this is the sink of x, right? And I believe in engineering, uh, sometimes you have to use this. A lot of times you may have to use this. All right, now, so this is very cool. And let's, th this is the sink. Let me just try to pronounce sign as S-I-G-N, the sign. I don't know, man. Well, we don't write S-I-G-N, we just write S-G-N. And this right here is just the sign of x. Either positive or negative, or maybe no positive, no negative, namely zero. So if you look at this, the definition for this is that this is equal to 1 if x is positive, 
because the sign, right? S I N G, right? S I S N the sign, S I G N, right? Anyway, and this is going to give a negative one if x is less than zero, and this is going to give you zero if x is equal to zero. And of course, you can just draw a picture real quick. If you do that, here is the deal. Well, if x is greater than zero, you get one, and you will have an open circle here. Just do this. If x is zero, you get zero, so you have a uh, zero here, and similarly, you get a negative one. So put it like this, and that, and with that, you are done. This is the sine function. So whenever you have sine of let's say negative five, you just get negative one because negative five is negative, etc., etc. And if you guys see my T-shirt, you guys will see I use this in one of the trig identity, which is very very useful, and I believe. In like a signal was whatsoever, you guys can leave a comment down below and let me know where you use this function, especially if you study engineering and all that stuff. So now that's the sine function. Very nice. Well, very cool though. I want to tell you guys one thing right here. What if you differentiate this right here? What do you get? You get zero. But what if you integrate this? You get the absolute value. Very nice. But the idea is that you can write it like this. If you differentiate absolute value of x, like this, right? Differentiating absolute value of x, you end up with the sine of x under the assumption that if x is not zero, because you cannot differentiate uh, absolute value when x is equal to zero. So that's the idea. So if you integrate that, you get the absolute value of x almost. So that's the third one that I want to tell you guys. And now let's just play around with the spelling. Let's talk about what if we just have S and I. So I'm just going to cut off some little things right here. Next one is going to get really fun because for the next one, we have the S I of X. This is not six. This is the sine integral of X. And technically, this is the capital S. So I will just have to make it bigger to make it more stand out. But this is not integral sign. Here is the integral sign. This right here is defined to be the integral. This is the integration sign. You go from zero to x and you integrate what? Well, in fact, you integrate the sink function. But let me just put on this right here because that's what we do. All right, anyway, you put on sign, but you don't put down x. You cannot use x right here and right here. So you will just have to put on t and over t, dt, like that. And again, if you use sync, it's actually mm, okay, probably, right? Anyway, this is the one that people would like to use anyway. This right here is the SI of X, the sine integral, and you also have the smaller version, namely the small, R, uh, small s and the small i and then the small x. And this is defined to be negative integral from x to infinity. And you have the sine t over t dt as well. And then I'm not going to draw you guys pictures, I will just tell you guys some really cool integral properties right here. If you look at this, right, the reason that you see that we have negative from negative integral from x to infinity, be really careful. If you do this minus that, so let me just tell you guys, if today you do si of x minus little s of i of x like this, in fact, you are doing the following. The integral from 0 to x of sine t over t dt minus, and this right here is the negative integral, so you get a plus integral of from 0 x to infinity of sine t, not it, sine t over t dt, like that. In another way, all in all, you end up with the integral from 0 to infinity because this is x, that's x, so you can just go all the way from 0 to infinity of sine t over t dt. And the deal is that this is nicely equal to pi over 2. Very, 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 very nice. Right? And in fact, I have a video on this already, so you guys would like, you guys can check that out. But if you guys know some famous value, sometimes if you count it, hey, you can just say, oh, hey, that's pi over 2, and you are done, and you're being impressive. Like people say, oh, wow, how did you do that? That's very nice. Sometimes I do that. I just memorize famous numbers to impress my students. That's my secret. Don't tell them, though. All right, now, so that's nice. And perhaps before I get into number five, let's talk about the sink thing anymore. Uh, 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 one more time. Because we end up with pi over 2 if you 
go from negative infinity to positive infinity because this right here is an even function you can just double that so you get pi another really cool thing is that if you talk about the sig you can look at the let me just write it down if you integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of the sink of x dx this right here it's nice to equal to the sum as n goes from negative infinity to positive infinity of sink of n that's impressive because how often do you see the integral is the same as the summation not often at all but this right here is actually true this right here is true because both of them will give you pi very very nice so again you can just remember this and you can, be, you can press girls if you would like now number five so we have five cousins of sine right well well let me just write this down better number five what if we don't have the i anymore huh let me just have the capital s of x like this and this is called the first nail integral right so let me just put this down right here first now integral and the definition for that is if you use the wikipedia the wikipedia definition i believe it's cleaner nicer you can also use the wolfram alpha definition you have the half pi in the input but doesn't really matter again this is s here is the integral the integral from 0 to x and instead of saying sine t over t what we do is sine and the input is t squared dt like that i think this is cleaner very very nice and i will also tell you guys a really cool result of this the idea is that if you take the limit as x goes to infinity namely you just go from 0 to infinity for this integral if you have the integral going from 0 to infinity of sine of t squared dt take a guess what this is the answer is not pi in fact it does have pi but it's not pi this is pi over 8 take the square root of it yeah i'm not looking at the answer i'm just looking at you guys all right again how do i know because i memorized this so i can make my video so that's pretty much it we have a lot of this variation of the sine functions very cool first nail integral of the sine and yeah perhaps let me give you guys an honorable mention this is the complex version of the sine function whenever you have sine of z let's say z is a complex number what you do is it's pretty much like this very similar looking but you do the following e and you have to have the i z and minus e to the negative i z all over 2i this is the complex version of the sine function and perhaps i'll just prove this real quick right here so the deal is if you look at the euler's formula namely you get e to the i theta that's equal to e to the of course i know e to i theta is equal to i e to i theta if you look at e to the i z this right here is equal to cosine z my plus i sine z and if you look at e to the negative i z so negative i z like this and now the deal is that you put negative i z sorry you put negative z into here and here and cosine it's an even function so negative i z it's the same as sorry cosine of negative z it's the same as cosine of positive z so inside here you get cosine of z and if you put i if you put negative z in here sine is an odd function so you can put the negative out so you have minus this is the i and you have the sine z like this so that's good and of course what we do next is that if you want to just solve the sine part what you can do is you can do the first equation minus the second equation so i'll just put a minus like this and we subtract the equations and you will get this minus that i minus negative i is 2i and of course we still have the sine c part so we have the sine c like this and this is equal to this minus that namely e to the i z minus e to the negative i z and of course divide both sides by 2i and you get that but let me just write it down again sine z it's equal to e to the i z minus e to the negative i z all over 2i which is that very very cool so 
we have six cousins for the sine function. Let me know which one do you guys like the most. Okay? Leave a comment down below and let me know. All right, so that's it. If you have any more cousins of sine that you want to add right here, please do so. Of course, I didn't mention cosine or the inverse sine, but you know, I think those are the ones that we already know. And I think this one are very cool. Yeah. Anyway, as always, that's it.